Hello class, this is the Time Hopewell Cycle, and this is Content 1, where we are going to learn about their beliefs and practices and artifacts and things like that. And today we are starting with the mounds. So reviewing our basic information, we are learning about the Hopewell Cultural Group. And we're going to talk about their artifacts. They made artifacts of copper, mica, obsidian, shell, clay, bone, cloth, and earthworks. They lived in Midwestern America with Ohio as the base during the time period of around 200 to 100 BCE to 500 CE. They made ceremonial mounds that were used for different purposes and they are earthwork structures. And they also created abstracted ornate craft forms and designs. And this is one of their rare figurative heads that you're seeing. So today we're looking at the mounds though. So our essential questions are, what is an earthwork? What is a mound? What are the characteristics of the mounds and what were they used for? In the picture, you're seeing one of two effigy mounds. This is the alligator mound. It's not quite as famous as the other one we're going to look at. And it's called the alligator because it vaguely resembles an alligator. You can see it drawn out at the top, and you can kind of see it here at the bottom. There's its head and shoulders and arms and back and legs and tail. And you can guess the size of it because... Uh, with the road that kind of goes around the mound and this elevated part is part of the mound it's not that that was added on or anything of that nature this is really small compared to the other mound that we're going to look at but it's still important so what earthworks are they are structures made by people and they're made by moving the earth or moving uncut rocks, so just natural stones. And they've been created from the Neolithic Age, which is the late Stone Age, which is 87,000 years before Common Era, to contemporary artworks. And here are three that we have talked about in Art One and Crafts One. Stonehenge in England at the top, which is probably the most famous earthwork in the world. Um, this is just a very small part of it that remains. It's the inner circle of the stones with them on top, and it serves as a calendar as well as a ceremonial site. And then you have the Nazca lions in Peru, the spider shown. There's other ones. There's the hummingbird and several more. These are giant carved lines into the earth. And even though there's vegetation there, you can still see them. But they, if you're on the ground, it just looks like a ditch or a line. You have to be up in the air in order to see it. So that was kind of a mystery because they were created way long before airplanes. And then a more modern earthwork that was built in the 70s is the Spiral Jetty in the Great Salt Lake that was done with um by robert smithton was the artist and piling and pushing the dirt into a spile that's shored up by natural stones sometimes it's covered with water sometimes it's not so the hopewell earthworks are uh all connected to this culture they go from very small mounds that are about three feet tall and about three feet, they're about three feet by three feet. So roughly the size of a pitcher's mound of baseball. Two large conical mounds that are about 70 or so feet tall. Some of these are built in steps, like um, sort of like the Aztec step pyramids. But some of them are just straight up mounds. There are effigy mounds. Effigy mounds are the mounds in the shape of animals, like the alligator mound. The most famous one is the Snake Mound. And then there are the raised roads and mounds that created the geometric shapes such as circles, octagons, squares, etc. that are connected by straight lines. And then there's walled areas on top of hills and mountains. 
these walled areas are not fortifications. They're not like forts or castles or things like that. They kind of, they think, served more as a place for people to sit or stand so that they could look down on the center and see what was going on there. Sort of like an arena. So over here is just a basic overview of some of the mounds that you can see. Uh, the Great Circle at Newark, the Hopewell, the Newark Earthworks with the Octagon, and there are lots of different types that we're going to be looking at. So before the Hopewell, there was the Adena culture, and they overlapped the Hopewell and probably turn, were people that turned into those that we know as Hopewell. And they built the small mounds, the three by three mounds, and they were burial mounds. Most people would be cremated when they died. Ooh, that's bad grammar, when they were died. When they were dead or when they died. And then the cremains would be gathered and covered with earth. Now, with the, their cremations, it takes a lot of heat to cremate a body. So ancient people would not cremate, would not just toss you on the fire and kind of let you get cooked. Um, because dead bodies are full of fluid. So what they would do would take you to a place, and it could be a sky burial where they have a platform so you're up in the air, or it could be sort of a fenced-in area, and they would put your body there. And then because these people were nomadic, they would just leave your body there, and by the time they circled back to that spot in a year, you would become a skeleton. And then they would pick up and retrieve your skeleton and put it with their other skeletons and then burn the bones, which are a lot easier to burn. And then those would be buried here. Only very important people, they buried their actual bodies. But most people were treated like that. So the way the burial mounds evolved and got larger and because they would do this revolving, so they would build mounds to bury people wherever it was on their circular kind of journey, going from place to place every year. You know, somebody died, they would leave them there to become a skeleton, and then they would go to their other places that they visited during the year. But at each of those other places, also, if somebody died, they wouldn't like haul them along, they would just leave them there until they were skeletonized and then make a mound. So regular people would be cremated and the ashes buried like I just talked about. And special people that were spiritually important would be buried. And this is how they did it. You can see this is a cutaway. This is an actual mound that was excavated and a photograph taken of a long time ago. And then this is a reconstruction of a mound. So you would have a log crypt at the bottom. That would be the area that was fenced in. If you were important, your body would have been laid in there and then covered with dirt and rock. And then you can see over here, these are smaller crypts that just have a collection of the bony ashes in them. All of that would be covered with the dirt and the rock. And then... Like here you are in the bottom, and then the next few years somebody else might die, and they put you, if you're important, on top and cover you with more dirt and rock, and then they put another layer of people and dirt and rock and so on and so forth, and the mound grows over the years. It's sort of like a layer cake with um, bodies inside of it. Okay, that was bad. Anyway, the snake mound, an effigy mound that is built in the shape of animals, and this is on our snake artwork. It's the largest existing effigy mound in the whole world. There is nothing inside of it, though. There are no artifacts. There are no burials. They've explored it with all of their fancy tricks like LIDAR, and there's nothing in there. But it does a lot of cool stuff. So first, let's look at it. 
the whole thing. This is the snake. This area here, this is its head, the triangle shape. And then its body curls and coils back around like this. And then to its tail. And then there's this thing between its jaws that's round. Uh, the most common interpretation, it's a uh, egg because you know snakes swallow eggs. Some people think that there might have been other parts of the mound extending off of it and it could represent like a frog, snakes eat frogs. And then other people think, and there's a reason for it, that that might represent the moon or the sun. Just like in Asia where the dragons eat the great pearl, which is the moon, and that's how the year changes and time changes. They're thinking something similar here. And the reason why they think that is that it aligns with astronomical signs. So the stars, the planets, the heavens. The head here points directly at the summer solstice sunset. So at the longest day of the year, if you're standing here in the middle where the jaws meet and looking out, it's a straight line to the sunset. And then the coils point directly to the sunsets of the spring and fall equinoxes. Those are the days where day and night are equal, approximately March 21st and September 21st. And the winter solstice, which is Christmas time, uh, December 21st. So that is a lot of observation and planning and technical figuring it out. And the snake mound is really, really big. Like that alligator mound that we saw earlier would take up like just this part, the egg. It's incredibly large. The Newark earthworks are just a little different. They were also created by the Hopewell culture in Newark, Ohio. And they consist of several different things. There is the Great Circle, which is the largest circular earthwork in North America, and it's a perfect circle. Think about how hard it is to draw a perfect circle, let alone build one with the dirt that is extremely big. Okay. There is the octagon that's this up here on the right which is lined up with the moon. It acts as a calendar for the 18.6 year lunar orbit, and it measures time with a greater precision than Stonehenge. And the videos that are linked help explain how that works so you can visualize it. And then the right earthworks have an almost perfectly square, which is not this square. This is another square. This is a different location but it's an almost perfect square that's aligned up again with astronomical features, the rising and setting of the sun, of Venus, of Mars, the visible planets. But that one was mostly destroyed by farming and they kind of went right through the middle with the Ohio Canal. So there's only a few photographs of it and a corner of it left. But here you can see the large shapes, and then there's smaller mounds within those shapes, and then there are these lines which are surprisingly straight, which are made of mounded earth. Now you're looking at a digital reconstruction. This is what it would look like if people weren't around, but there is a lot of development in this area. So over the octagon, which is this area. This is what happens with the moon. If you stand here in the middle of the circle and face the octagon, you are looking directly at the rising moon. And then each time it shifts the way it swings, because the moon will go to here and then it will disappear because it's gone beyond our sight range on the earth and then it comes back up and so on and so forth. This is a time-lapse photography. There are marks on the octagon that mark every single angle of the importance risings of the moon.
and that's explained in the video much better than what I explained it to you here. And there's not a whole lot of words. It's explained by looking at it. So your assignment is I see the moon. You need your Chromebook. I want you to watch the two short videos that are linked in the classroom. They're about the moon and the octagon mound. And then I want you to answer this question. Why do you think the moon and having those very precise measurements was so important to the Adena and Hopewell people? Um, there's all sorts of theories about it, but I want to know what you think. Okay. Because remember, these are prehistoric people. They didn't have, to the best of our knowledge, a written language. They were nomadic. They did not farm. They were hunter-gatherers. They did not have bows and arrows, or horses, or corn, or a lot of the other things. This was before all that happened. And yet they were able to build these great, big, perfect areas. And then I also want you to think about how the moon is important to us. Is it important to us other than just being a pretty thing up there in the sky? What does the moon do? Okay. And you could answer that any way you like. All right. That's it.